Hi, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me and Chris on this Wednesday evening for a session on global macro strategies. Chris is an expert on alternative strategies, and I'm excited to be co-hosting this session with him and learning more about global macro from him. The next few slides that you're going to see are disclosures and disclaimers from, from Endalis and Wellington Management. Um, many in our audience today, and we have clients from Hong Kong and Singapore dialing in, uh, should be familiar with Endalis. But for those who are not, I'll just spend a minute or two on the intro. Uh, Endalis is a digital wealth advisor for everyone. You know, whether you're starting um, out on your investing journey or whether, you know, maybe you have a PhD in finance and you already have spent decades investing, um, we can help you and we can help make it better. We have a whole suite of investment options to help you get started and a team of client advisors and cutting edge technology to help you determine investments that are right for you. We are also fee-based, which means that we charge our clients a flat fee based on their assets under advisory with us. We don't do sales charges. We don't accept trailer fees or distribution fees. Uh, what we do is we work with our fund managers like Wellington, for example, to get our clients access to institutional share classes. So institutional share classes are share classes that are usually available to just institutional advisors, uh, sorry, investors or um, endowments, foundations, but, and they don't include trailer fees. Where we can, we try to get access to those for our clients. But if we can't, what we do is we give you back 100% of all the trailer fees that we get. So this means that there is really no conflict of interest. Uh, we don't push you to the costliest products with the highest trailer fee just to make more money for ourselves. Uh, instead, we try to advise you to pick the right products based on your risk tolerance level and your goals. We are backed by some of the largest investors in the world, including SoftBank, Lightspeed, and other notable names such as UBS, Singtel, Samsung, et cetera. So they, they believe in us, and I hope that you believe in us as well. A part of our mission, as you can see here on this very busy slide, is to empower our clients to be better investors and arm them with more knowledge. As such, we produce a lot of content to help inform on the principles of investing. And today's webinar is just one example. We wanna keep this session as useful and interactive as possible. So please send in all the questions you have on global macro investing, and I'll be sure to direct them to Chris, the expert. Um, here's the link, you see the link and the password to Slido. So please uh, log in and ask some questions. Now on to global macro. But first, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, Chris Pere. Chris is a managing director at Wellington Management and he's a member of the investment product and fund strategies team. He's responsible for overseeing Wellington managed alternative investment strategies and works primarily with Wellington's macro and credit investment teams and is responsible for a range of business and investment related activities. Chris, um, you can't tell from his looks, but also has years of investment experience, having worked at SSGA prior to joining Wellington in 2010. So I'll now pass the mic over to Chris, who will tell you more about himself and Wellington management. Well, thank you, Min, and, and thank you for your very kind words. I always um, appreciate when people tell me uh, that I look young. And, um, that's always a, a very nice compliment. Uh, you know, and I guess also just want to thank um, everybody for joining this webcast uh, today. On behalf of um, everybody that works at Wellington, uh, we certainly appreciate your time and interest in learning more about um, a category of investing that, frankly, again, we, we believe um, will continue to um, you know, really serve clients and their portfolios well uh, into the future. Let me just tell you a, a quick uh, couple of uh, facts about Wellington. M many of you may know us, um, others may have heard about uh, our firm. And, and I, you know, I think there are a couple of key attributes that, that you may find interesting about our organization. Um, the first thing to highlight is that Wellington is a private partnership. Uh, we only do one thing for clients, and that is to invest uh, money on their behalf or on behalf of, uh, you know, underlying beneficiaries for a fee. Uh, Wellington does not uh, sell research. We do not have any other uh, third party services. And as a result, again, it creates a very strong alignment 
in terms of the objectives that we're trying to achieve again on behalf of our clients. Uh, this private partnership has uh, endured for a number of decades. Um, again, as you can see on this page, uh, the firm and its uh, history dates all the way back to uh, the early 1900s um, when we launched our first, what we call balanced mutual fund. Today, Wellington is again, a, a large uh, diversified asset manager. We we're running currently about 1.1 trillion in assets on behalf of, as you can see, about over 20, uh, 2,000 clients, uh, serving cl uh, those clients in over 63 countries uh, around the world. We have 18 offices at present, so are very global in nature, Singapore uh, in, and also Hong Kong in, in your specific regions are both uh, very large and established investment centers that um, have been in operation for a number of years. And today, one of our key areas of focus from a strategic standpoint is the idea that alternatives uh, remain a very important part of client portfolios. And so today, again, we are going to talk about global macro strategies, which I would define as one of the core underlying allocations that a number of institutional and more high net worth or global wealth oriented clients either currently have investments in or are frankly actively looking to make investments in. So with that, um, that is a quick overview of Wellington. Um, and maybe I'll pause and uh, midterm maybe back over to you. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you so much. Um, in this next slide, I'll attempt to introduce and explain what global macro investing means to me. And then hand you back over to Chris, who has a much deeper understanding, and he can go into the intricacies of such strategies. So it's a very busy slide again, but global macro is essentially an investment strategy that fund managers or investors use. To, um, to make use of broad macroeconomic trends and events that affect countries and economies and financial markets worldwide. So it involves a lot of research and analysis and really sophisticated tools to understand and predict the interplay of different factors, uh, ranging from economic indicators to government policies. And so this means that there is a lot of a lot of um, aspects that you need to consider. So you need really sophisticated and re well-resourced managers to manage the strategies well. The macroeconomic analysis, um, that's the part that is difficult to do on your own. So that's why we trust partners like Wellington to, to dive into the research and conduct all the analysis to understand the overall uh, economic health, the growth prospects, and structural challenges that countries and regions might be facing. So this is a top-down approach as opposed to other strategies and investment funds that you might be more familiar with, which tend to be more bottom-up fundamental research oriented. So really doing a deep dive on companies and then bubbling up to an investment strategies. For global macro, it's top-down. So you start with the analysis of the entire global economy and then you go down to maybe specific regions and countries, and then finally narrowing down to different sub subsectors. Um, so there are a few characteristics here. They usually span across, the, the strategies usually span across different asset classes because fund managers have to utilize different factors and different financial instruments to express their opinions or views on macro events and how they might play out. And because of uh, the unpredictable nature of these events and trends, risk management is also a very important aspect. And these can include from, you know, uh, such position sizing, um, stop loss orders and hedging strategies to make sure that the, the fund manager is limiting losses in the case when markets may move against the trends and bets that the fund manager is making. Um, I'm very sure that a lot of you are very familiar with some of these macro events that have occurred, but maybe you haven't really related it to global macro investing. So I'm just going to take some time to explain this one very famous example, which is Mr. George Soros' trade against the British pound in 1992. Um, in the early 1990s, the United Kingdom or the UK was a part of the European 
exchange rate mechanism, uh, which is really, which aims to stabilize exchange rates between the different European countries. And the British pound at that time was packed to the Deutsche Mark uh, within a very narrow tolerance band. And this was way before the Euro. Um, so Mr. George Soros and his team conducted a lot of research and analysis and came to the conclusion that the pound may be overvalued and that uh, the current economic situation in the UK was not sustainable. So they believed that eventually the Bank of England will not be able to maintain the pound's pack to the Deutsche Mark. So what they did, or yes, what he did and the, what the team did was really to initiate this uh, short selling strategy. So short selling is when you borrow certain things to sell. So you're not selling things that you already own, you're borrowing and then you're selling and you're hoping to buy it back at a later time at a much lower price and that way you close out the position and lock in the profit. So what they did was they short sold the pound and with the expectation that they will buy it back at a much lower price. Um, George Soros also made public statements about his opinion on the pound, um, making kind of a negative sentiment on the currency. So on Black Wednesday, which is September 16, 1992, the UK government tried to raise the rates in order to defend the pound and maintain the pack. But, you know, the short selling persisted that the pound was still sold off, is still sold off aggressively. So eventually they couldn't defend it anymore. And the UK government had to withdraw from the ERM and let the pound float freely. So this meant that it was no longer packed to the Deutsche Mark. And so the value of the pound dropped significantly, resulting in losses for those that were invested in the pound or who were holding the pound, and also making a lot of profit for those who were short the pound. So a lot of profit for Mr. Soros and his team. Uh, it was estimated that they might have made a profit of a billion dollars from this trade. So that's just one example. And on the other right-hand side, you will see a lot more examples. And one of them, very famous, made into a movie, The Big Short. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you will know what it's about. But if you want to know more, please feel free to you know, read up on it or look into the examples shown. Um, with that, I'll turn to Chris now to go over the different types of macro investing strategies. Great, thanks, thanks, Min. Um... As Min, Min has highlighted, um, you know, macro is a very, um, you know, very diverse and, uh, you know, in some ways what we call, uh, you know, very heterogeneous space, meaning there's a lot of different ways that you can implement a macro idea or strategy within a portfolio. And so, um, you know, one, one thing I always like to do is, um, well, maybe especially, you know, as uh, the world here has evolved and we have access to things like artificial intelligence is just ask the computer, what what is macro investing? Because I think it's always important to kind of, you know, compare what our opinions are to, you know, generally, um, well, in this case, what, what a computer may think. And so, as you can see, we, we asked um, ChatGBT, what, what is a global macro strategy? And, and what I read here is actually somewhat, I think, what Min has highlighted is that you know a macro investment approach trades across a very uh, diverse set of assets, first of all, and really at the end of the day is rooted in uh, research and importantly research that has a degree of underpinnings of economic you know uh, fundamentals and understanding. But as I said, right, the, the thing that's really interesting about macro is, is that it just can span so many different things in so many different parts of the world. Um, and I think that's what makes it such an elegant type of an approach is, is that there always is something going on that may or may not be understood uh, by the market, which creates, frankly, inefficiencies that can be taken advantage of. So whether it be, um, you know, again, back in, I think that was the 19, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s with the British pound and what uh, George Soros was able to do. Uh, whether it was as all the other examples that have been highlighted, you know, these are events that, that frankly, sometimes aren't fully understood. Uh, and whether it be one, one individual has one opinion and, and another has another, that, that's where those inefficiencies can get created and create some really big opportunities to take advantage of. 
And I think as we move forward, that's what also gives us a lot of excitement and confidence about this type of strategy. And we'll get into this in a little bit, but the, you know, the world uh, looks quite uncertain to us from an economic perspective as we move forward. And there's a number of both, let's call it near-term and more longer-term structural reasons why. And when you get uncertain, you tend to get a lot of volatility in markets. And macro investing historically has been shown to be a type of investing style that tends to do really well when you get a lot of uncertainty and therefore volatility in markets. So again, we're quite excited about it. Um, if you look at the next page, and again, this was somewhat already highlighted um, from an opportunity set standpoint, macro investing does really span the, the really full gamut of what I would define as the public and liquid um, markets that exist uh, globally. So whether it be fixed income, uh, currencies or foreign exchange markets, equities and commodities, um, macro uh, oriented strategies typically will invest across this uh, landscape. Uh, with that said, though, as we've highlighted here on this page, what we tend to find, um, both even within our own uh, capabilities at Wellington, but more generally within the industry, is that macro strategies tend to emphasize uh, fixed income and currency markets. And then we'll, you know, dabble, um, but have, you know, certainly a less degree of prominence in their portfolios, either be from an exposure or risk standpoint to the equity and commodity markets. And one of the reasons for that is, is that, as has been highlighted, right, is, is that um, macro investing really does, uh, you know, is deeply rooted in economic understanding and really trying to find that intersection between what an economy is telling you and what the underlying markets are um, pricing. And at times those can be disconnected. And that's where you find, again, situations like the British pound being extremely overvalued um, because there is that disconnect and that intersection doesn't necessarily align with what uh, you generally are looking for. And um, the instruments that tend to have a very uh, good relationship with the underlying economic fundamentals tend to be things like fixed income and currency. So, you know, one example in the fixed income markets, as many of you may know, is, is that, um, you know, a lot of the instruments in fixed income are actually tied to monetary policy. So whether you look, say, at the two-year interest rate uh, or the two-year treasury bond in the U.S., right, that tends to be a very good proxy for near-term expectations of where interest rates are going. And where interest rates are going is typically determined by a central bank. So in this case, the Federal Reserve. And so being able to uh, understand that, and in, in some cases position uh, for that, or I, I understand whether the Fed is gonna be increasing or uh, decreasing interest rates can be a strategy that, that actually can take advantage of um, that economic understanding. Foreign exchange markets, again, a, a useful tool. And, and I think where we um, you know, believe equities and commodities can be useful is this notion of really adding dimensions to a macro strategy and not necessarily being reliant on one style or one asset class to really drive returns. And um, this kind of gets me to an, another point is, is that you know, for a number of decades, not excuse me, decades, for about a decade, um, you know, macro investing was a little bit challenged because, you know, markets really um, were very healthy. There was not a whole lot of volatility. And, and so therefore, the, the more kind of traditional mechanisms for taking advantage of macro investing, again, across fixed income currencies was, was a little bit challenged. So we found that a lot of really successful macro funds have been able to diversify into other asset classes and really add a lot of different dimensions to what they do. Before I move on to the next slide, though, the, the last thing I want to highlight is, and I, I think this was maybe a question, is, is, you know, what are the different ways that you can implement a macro uh, portfolio or investment approach? And as I said, um, you know, macro is a very heterogeneous style of investing. There's no one right or wrong way of doing it. And as a result, you tend to find a lot of different um, approaches, whether they are more concentrated, meaning they take really big bets whether they tend to be more diversified in terms of spreading out their bets to different underlying markets and instruments. 
uh, whether they're more uh, fundamental or discretionary in nature, whether they're more systematic or quantitative in nature, those are also very common approaches. And then one that, that has certainly grown in um, uniqueness is this idea of running a macro strategy that really um, aims to embed a lot of specialization within the underlying portfolio versus the more traditional approach that a la the George Soros approach, which is having one key individual make all the underlying investment calls within the portfolio. They're getting a more kind of single manager CIO driven approach. Today, what we find is, is that the, the, the more common and uh, interesting way of accessing a macro fund is to really look for funds that are specialized, meaning they have a lot of underlying people and resources um, and give those people and resources a lot of independence to go into their little pockets of opportunities, uh, find them, and then have the independence and autonomy to put those ideas or trades into the fund or portfolio in a very unimpeded way. So um, like you know, many of you know, diversification right, is one of the, the really only free lunches in, in investing, as they say. Um, it's one thing you, if you can um, intelligently embed it, it you know, has a lot of beneficial attributes. And macro funds, in a lot of cases, have moved to this model of a, a multi-manager or specialist-driven approach just given the fact, again, that these are very wide uh, and diverse markets. And therefore, if you can spread out your bets to different people that have maybe, frankly, very different views, is it can really embed a lot of diversification and uh, smooth out the ride of creating more consistent, positive return profile over time. So we, we're finding that a lot of the, the more modern oriented macro approaches tend to utilize this multi-manager or specialist driven approach. On the next page, we uh, highlight here just two simple examples of, of how uh, you know a, a macro strategy um, can find opportunities. And so maybe this is the other uh, implementation way to, to think about macro. In that, in a lot of cases, you know what you will find is that a, a macro uh, strategy will look to trade from a directional standpoint, meaning it will uh, again identify the British pound as being overvalued and therefore a short candidate or um, the U.S. equity market to be undervalued from a price to book standpoint and therefore an attractive long uh, candidate. Those are more directional type of uh, positions, um, tend to be, you know, uh, very profitable if identified correctly, uh, positioned early and um, in some cases have a longer time horizon to them, or in some cases they can have a shorter time horizon uh, and are very common within a macro uh, fund. So on the left-hand side, you'll see an example uh, that I highlighted here uh, of a trade, you know, again, that many from our understanding um, funds had on say last year. Uh, and really was the idea that, you know, uh, if you looked at measures of inflation, uh, inflation very, very quickly, you can see in the, let's call it late uh, 2020 and into 2021 and 2022 skyrocketed, right? You can see on the, on the left-hand side of that chart uh, in terms of the axis that inflation went from about zero right after COVID to 9% on the headline basis in the US in a matter of, let's call it 18 months. That um, was a very profound change. And I think many of us know why that happened. Uh, it was a function of um, supply side uh, constraints, right? As we, we moved out of COVID um, and, you know, people wanted to consume and, uh, you know, again, a, a number of factories and, uh, uh, you know, very much just in time kind of delivery um, manufacturing, you know, was really constrained and, and not able to restart in time, it created a lot of inflation. And that inflation uh, did persist for a long period of time. And the fixed income markets were not prepared for that. Um, because, right, what was happening was our central banks around the world were telling us that inflation was going to remain fairly low. And so that created a big opportunity to get ahead of that position by going uh, short the fixed income markets here through what we call the two-year rate, two years forward, or again, um, kind of a proxy for, for um, 
future potential monetary policy and uh, take advantage of that as, as Minute highlighted through a short position, betting that rates are gonna go higher, fixed income prices are gonna go lower. And so therefore, if we sell those prices today and then buy them back in the future, we can earn a profit in doing so. So that would be one example. The other example tip, you know, for a typical strategy is to take, put on a non-directional position where at the end of the day, um, you're looking to find two assets that tend to be very highly correlated. And um, as a result, uh, that correlation potentially can break down and create really interesting mean reversion opportunities. And so these, these types of positions tend to not really have, um, again, a, a big directional lean, but really, really what you're trying to do is find situations where there's mean reversion potential. And one of my favorite ones in fixed income is this, uh, this position or, or phenomenon that happened in uh, 2021, where the um, Austrian fixed income markets, in particular at the very, very, very long end of the bond market there, uh, exhibited a big dislocation that you can see on, on this page, um, where the very long end uh, bond market started to price uh, in a big, big amount of additional yield uh, relative to the, the again, the 30-year the proxy of that, that bond market or the, on the curve. And that really doesn't, frankly, make a whole lot of economic sense, right? Is, is that at the very, very long end, the, you know, the 100-year bond, right? That's a, it's a very unique instrument is if you're a country or any, any institution and can issue debt out to 100 years, um, the, you're likely or have a very, very low probability of defaulting. Um, and in the case of Austria, I think they have a double A, maybe even a triple A, a credit rating. So very, very low chance of defaulting. Yet what happened here is that you can see is that all of a sudden, the very long end, the market starts pricing in that maybe there's a little bit more risk uh, to that happening. And economically, from our perspective, that you know didn't really make a whole lot of sense. And so um, it created this really unique opportunity to put on what we call a curve flattener position, betting that the long, long end, the ultra long end, the 100 year bond uh, was dislocated and therefore was going to exhibit some degree of mean reversion relative to the more kind of um, traditional part of a bond market, the 30-year instrument. So those are two fixed income examples. Um, again, there are countless other examples I can highlight, and I think that's what makes macro so fascinating and such a unique type of strategy is, is that uh, if you can find people uh, or managers that have expertise in doing this, uh, it can be a very profitable type of strategy to add to the portfolio. And lastly, as we're going to talk about, I think next, um, provide a number of unique benefits when you think about it from a holistic portfolio perspective. Thank you, Chris. I actually have a number of questions just based on what sure. you said. It's really interesting. Um, you, you know, you mentioned that you've started to see a trend to its more multi strategies within the global macro space. So instead of just having more directional, it could be, would you say that that means that there's gonna be more non-directional strategies versus directional? And that means that there is less risk involved with the non-directional strategies? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so maybe just uh, I'll expand upon what I was saying a little bit earlier is that I, I think, um, so if you look at the time period from, let's call it uh, 2012 to 2016, 2017, maybe even a little bit later, um, you know, the world was a very, uh, it was a very unique part of time, right? Where we had just come out of, you know, two big crises, the first being the, the global financial crisis. And then right after that, many of you will remember, and I saw you highlighted on, on that page earlier, uh, you know, we also exhibited the kind of the, the second order effects in Europe of the European sovereign debt crisis. So those were two really, really big shocks. And it forced um, policymakers, i.e. central banks, to um, put on monetary policy that was very accommodative. And that, that degree of accommodation um, really changed the way that markets behave um, in frankly, very non-fundamental ways. And the result was, is that you could just simply, um, you know, invest in the, you know, ultimately what happened, right, is, is that policy went to very accommodative 
and it created um, a very one dimensional um, market, meaning all you really had to do was uh, buy bonds and stocks and kind of sit on a very passively oriented portfolio and do very well. And again, I think a lot of us did that. And it, it was a, a very profitable um, way of investing. What, what was not what was very um, non-existent during that time was volatility. And um, as a result, as I said at the beginning, when, when you don't have a whole lot of volatility, um, it tends to be somewhat of a challenging way of investing from a more active uh, perspective. And, you know, macro investing is a very active style, it tends to trade a lot, tends to exhibit a lot of turnover. And when you don't have movements in markets, it, it you know, it can be somewhat of a challenging uh, environment. And so the more directionally oriented macro type of strategies did struggle during that time period. And so what we found is that a lot of macro funds or macro managers have learned uh, from the lessons of that time period and learn that you know one of the ways to really um, ensure that you know uh, at the end of the day we're in the business of delivering um, compelling performance for our investors. One of the ways to you know really um, ensure that that can remain the case is to add dimensions, right? Add different types of strategies that may be a little bit less uh, reliant, say, on a specific underlying market environment. So that when you go through a full cycle, whether it be we go back to uh, the period of, um, again, 2012 to 2017, where all you had to do is invest in the equity markets, we want to have a subset of the strategies that can do well in that environment. And, and equally, it, like the environment we seem to be in right now, where there's actually a lot of volatility, we also want to have a set of strategies that can do well in that type of environment. So this kind of notion of, of finding a multi-strategy oriented macro approach does have you know, its merits. And um, that's what we are finding is, is that yes, finding um, strategies that have macro underpinning. So in the example I gave of the Austrian uh, bond market, you know, fundamentally uh, is totally sound, right? Um, you know, from a credit quality perspective, Austria is, is not, on our radar as, as a you know a um, a country that we think is all of a sudden going to spiral into default, and so when they're when that bond market starts to exhibit a, a dislocation, uh, if it economically doesn't make sense, and we can put on a very elegant position that doesn't really expose us to the underlying direction of the Austrian market or of the Austrian interest rate market, that can have benefits, right? And in in a lot of ways, uh, tends to be uncorrelated to what's happening from a more directional standpoint. So yes, we are finding a lot of macro strategies move into this direction of being somewhat uh, multi-strategy and, and multi-dimensional across whether it be asset class, right? So trading across all those, those asset class that I've defined, whether it be stylistic, you know, so as I said, some macro funds have both systematic and discretionary strategies in them. And then also, um, again, trying to find different styles of investing within that has proven to be a, a recipe for success. Thank you, Chris, that was very insightful. Um, actually related to that, there is a question on Slido. The, this um, person asks, prior to last year's strong performance, macro funds have had a very bad decade. Yeah. Do you expect a performance to improve considering a change in regime? We're going back to the old normal versus the new normal, so. It's a great question. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, the answer kind of has two parts to it. The first is, is that uh, there, from our perspective, we certainly do believe that um, the old regime uh, is back again, meaning the, you know, the, the era of uh, elevated economic uncertainty is um, a phenomenon that we don't think is going away. And so if you assume that there's more economic uncertainty, that likely means there's gonna be more uh, volatility in markets as we move forward. So we put a slide together on that. Um, I think it's on page 22. Um, that kind of outlines this from our perspective. And, and what, what we do here is, um, maybe it's the next slide, there you go, yeah. What we do here is um, just simply take the, um, you know, measure again of inflation 
and uh, create a measure of actually inflation volatility, right? Or what is the standard deviation of, um, you know, a rolling 12 month measure of, of um, US headline inflation. And as you can see, uh, you know, again, from a, about uh, 2011, 2012, as I said, from all the way to, you know, 2018, 2019, inflation uh, was low, right? And so there was really not a whole lot of economic volatility around that specific measure. That clearly has changed. And, and we think there are a number of reasons why, uh, in this case, you know, inflation uncertainty is likely to remain elevated um, for reasons like demographics, right? Demographics are changing. Um, around the world uh, in a number of different parts of the world. And those demographic changes uh, are going to create um, changes in productivity. Uh, and that's going to have a big implication on the world. The other one that, you know, the other kind of D out there, right, is uh, deglobalization, right? Uh, that is a phenomenon that at least, you know, over the, the next, uh, let's call it decade or so, does not seem to be uh, going back the other way, back to a more globalized world. And so those are going to have big implications. You know, I, I mentioned a little bit ago that, um, you know, if, the, if you know, we truly are in a world of deglobalization, then just-in-time manufacturing may not necessarily be uh, currently set up to be successful. And so, you know, that, that's going to have implications from an, ec uh, an economic perspective and in particular things like inflation. So we assume inflation at the very least is going to remain more volatile and more cyclical, that likely means we're going to have to go through more real cycles, right? So if you think about a cycle on the dimension, say, of growth and inflation, um, right now, you know, we're, we're in a period of, you know, decelerating uh, growth and decelerating uh, inflation. And um, that likely at some point will bottom. Right, and and that will uh, require central banks to adjust policy from right now, which is somewhat uh, tight, right, and and not very accommodative, to more accommodative, and that's going to create a big trend and therefore a lot of opportunities. So we do think we're going to go through these uh, more pro profound or um, uh, more more you know prolonged, I guess, cycles, and. Um, that's going to create a lot of opportunities along the way across all four of the quadrants that would make up, again, the dimensions of growth and inflation. So there's that element. The other thing, um, you know, that I want to emphasize, though, is that if we do somewhat end up back in a period of, of more, let's call it uh, uh, homogeneous markets, where, again, whether it be equity markets are on a big bull run, whether it be the fixed income markets are on a, um, a bear run, uh, you know, th that will still create opportunities. And as I mentioned, as macro funds really have modernized to be more multi-strategy in nature, we think it will create a lot of opportunities as well. And um, really not necessarily subject us to the pain that was um, you know, the case for about a decade as has been highlighted here. So we're, we're quite positive on this space, both from an alpha opportunity set standpoint, but also uh, from the added benefit that macro funds provide investors, which is, um, I think we're gonna talk about next is this element of diversification, right? Which in an environment of uncertainty is a really important attribute that we think a lot of, in a lot of cases, clients are underexposed to and need to actively consider. Thank you, Chris, that was great. That was really helpful. Um, so sure. let me just go back to some of the slides. Well, now we've gone over like the different types of strategies. Um, and this slide really just kind of summarizes what Chris had talked about, you know, the advantages of investing in global macro strategies, diversification. If, you're a, if you have strong views, you may want to pick a manager that has similar views and capitalize on some of these trends. Um, there is, of course, potential for a huge alpha generation, but that comes with also high risk. And um, as you can see from the chart on the right, I think Chris has already mentioned that there are different types of strategies with very different uh, performance profile, risk return profile and performances just over the years. So this is really just, you know, taking from 20, 2000 to 2018, but um, yeah, it's still very valid this today. Well, and yeah, and I think I think last last year was a sorry, man, just to 
to highlight that, you know, la last year was probably, um, you know, I, I think as the, one of the, the questions or comments was made is that, you know, last year was a really good year for, for macro funds, but uh, even within that good year, there was a lot of performance disparity. And I think that uh, really comes down to, again, the style, uh, the implementation of, of, a, of the macro fund that uh, you're looking at. Um, and that, again, it's a very different space. And so, you know, I, I saw numbers of some macro funds up in that, you know, some of these ranges that I see in, you know, 20, 2008, where they were up um, 50 plus percent. Uh, and then some, you know, there was a, a big cohort that was more in the, you know, as you can see in the 95, 95th percentile up about 20%. So um, it, it does range a lot. I think where we found that really what a client is looking for is that consistent all weather type of positive return outcome with importantly, this, this very clear focus on preserving on the downside, meaning not subjecting uh, our investors and their uh, capital to big losses. Um, and so that, that is, you know, that's tricky. It's hard to do that, but that, um, you know, the high flyers uh, that can make 50 plus percent, um, what we found is that tends to not be um, one repeatable. It's very hard to do that uh, for multiple years. And two, uh, you know, difficult for clients to be able to stomach the other side of that, right? Is, is that it's equally plausible that you could lose 50 plus percent and um, is not really what many are, are interested in. So, when you take those numbers and kind of distill them into what ultimately is, we think repeatable and achievable, it's more in the high single, low double digit from a net return standpoint. Uh, with you know uh, drawdowns that can be of similar size, but of less frequency, I think is kind of where ultimately the sweet spot lies. Thank you, Chris. Sure. So I, I'm going to hand, hand it over to you for the next few slides. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, again, I, I think why the, you know, why, why are we here? Why, you know, why does this, um, why is this such an interesting space for um, investors like yourselves to consider? And I, I think, I think we've touched upon this is, um, you know, macro strategies in a lot of ways are one of the unique categories that does provide kind of two, you know, again, if you, if you identify the right manager, two really attractive benefits. So the first one, again, somewhat, somewhat obvious, but the ability to deliver um, alpha is, from our perspective, um, possible. And um, that alpha, again, also has, the, you know, the, the notion that if you find the right manager, repeatable. And in, in that, um, you know, the, the macro style really does aim to capitalize on inefficiencies, right? Um, I think what we're suggesting is, is that um, the public markets in specific pockets can be uh, at times or um, persistently inefficient. And uh, skilled managers therefore can extract the alpha that is uh, available in these markets. And so that, you know, that, that is the, the first thing, but obviously in, in a world where, um, you know, returns are extremely important or the ability to deliver some degree of uh, outperformance uh, relative to the market is, is really important. Um, again, macro strategies can be a useful tool for that. I think the other thing though that um, is equally important in this environment is being able to uh, find a strategy that can um, offset the effects of your traditional uh, asset performance, right? So at the end of the day, uh, we all have exposure to the underlying markets. That, that's just simply a function of investing, right? Is, is um, you know, having a portfolio full of uh, equities and bonds and, and other uh, traditional assets, um, you know, there is a, a high degree of correlation between how your portfolio is gonna perform um, and how the underlying markets are going to perform. And so, you know, in a year like last year, and I think we have a, a slide on this, um, you know, that traditional portfolio mix, say of, you know, 60% bonds, 
or 60 for that stock, excuse me, and 40% in, in fixed income, um, did experience a, a fairly material uh, degree of underperformance, which we highlight on that right chart there. Again, what we're just doing is showing you uh, the calendar years of a traditional 60, 40 portfolio, I think uh, US equities and um, US fixed income. And you know, over the last call it uh, four or five decades, I think this was the second highest negative calendar return on record. So it tends not to happen all that often, but again, I think from our perspective, it could happen more often. And, and the reason for that is this kind of notion of potentially us moving into a different regime where, as you can see on the, on the left chart, there were um, a number of years where both fixed income and equity markets were equally challenged. And if we were to go back into a world like that, um, you know, where repeatable, consistent, positive performance from more traditional assets would be called into question, finding strategies that, that really are not uh, beholden or, or not, don't really require you know, an uptrend in the more traditional asset classes can be really valuable. Um, and that's what, you know, essentially macro provides is that, um, again, macro is designed to be an uncorrelated source of return. And um, embedded in that is typically when macro strategies do well is typically when you find uh, other more traditional assets to be called into question or compromised like last year. So again, I, I know somebody had highlighted last year was a really good year for macro. It was. Um, and again, it provided tremendous offset, right, to what happened, which was, you know, uh, a 60-40 portfolio was down almost 20%. Like that, that really, I think, hurt. But if you had, a, you know, a macro strategy to help offset some of that, that, that had a, a big, important element of diversification. So, you know, we, we find macro to be one of the few investment categories that does provide this kind of um, diversification benefit. And so therefore, um, considering it as part of your portfolio, not in a huge way, but as a, you know, a, um, a satellite type of strategy to add to your more traditional assets can be really useful. Thank you, Chris. I definitely agree with you there. Um, I think we've already touched on this slide. So maybe just going to move on quickly actually just kind of compounding what Chris has already talked about. This is really a case study where we had, uh, we have four different portfolios, one the 60-40, this time it's using the Acqui and the Global Ag, and uh, three portfolios with varying allocations to global macro, which is represented by HFRI macro index. Um, so this is an index of, I, I believe, equal weights of different macro strategies. So it's, really just the average performance of the average global macro fund within the index. And um, that's no, I don't know that it's typical, it's representative of all the global macro strategies out there. We've already seen that it's a heterogeneous universe. So yeah, but when you add some allocations to it, you can see that the, the drawdown can be better controlled. So really, this chart is difficult to read, but it's just to illustrate two, two points. One is that diversification really helps, whether it's adding fixed income or global macro, because you see that the light blue line is actually the S&P 500, which has the largest drawdown versus the other portfolios. Um, the green line is the 60-40, 60% uh, equity, 40% fixed income, and that actually did better than the 100% equity portfolio in drawdowns. And the dark blue line is the portfolio with 40% equity, 40% fixed income, and 20% global macro. So uh, this is not to say that we all should go out and put 20% you know, allocation to global macro strategies, but it's really just to illustrate that it can really help with diversification. Um, and then again, looking at these four portfolios with the four different circles and looking over the different periods, you can see that from the five, three, five and 10 year periods, the, the gray dot, which is the, uh, I wanna say 55% equity, 40% fixed income and 5% global macro, that actually has the best risk return profile out of all four 
But when you look at the 20 year period, that changes too. So 60, 40 has done. So this is really just to say, you know, we should, whenever we want to invest in something, please look at your time horizon, what kind of investment horizon you have, your risk tolerance, what return, uh, what risk profile you want. And um, so as to decide what kind of allocations you want to different asset classes. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Chris to close out with the ideal environment for um, global macro strategies. Yeah, th thanks, Ben. So the 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 punchline here is is that um, as as we've talked about, you know, in periods of uncertainty, um, what happens in, in periods of whether it be economic or or financial market uncertainty, uh, volatility tends to go up because. Um, investors for various different reasons um, can either panic or uh, can get greedy. And uh, that creates a lot of movement, again, amongst the markets. And so, um, you know, we you can easily measure that through a, a measure like the VIX index, which essentially takes um, the implied volatilities of a number of underlying equity securities and um, measures it over an annualized basis. And you know, um, there will be times, and, and this has happened over again, multiple decades where volatility tends to um, go up and stay elevated for, for quite a long period of time. And, I, and as I think I've articulated, we think we're back in a regime or world where volatility is gonna remain elevated. There are a number of different reasons why um, we think that's the case. And a lot of it really comes down to a, a world that does look fairly uncertain to us um, as we move out. We've got the uh, U.S. debt ceiling here in, in the next couple of weeks that may or may not get resolved. Um, we are you know, rapidly going to be approaching uh, a U.S. election cycle. Um, we've got a number of economies around the world that are still uh, suffering from elevated inflation. Um, we've got more structural trends that that again, frankly, suggests that, um, you know, the policies of the past decade or so are likely uh, not going to be able to be um, replicated. And so that all to us suggests more uncertainty. And when we get more uncertainty, we get more volatility. And that tends to be a very opportunity rich environment for a macro fund or a macro strategy. And as we, as you can see here, um, we have uh, charted that where um, what we're doing here is taking the VIX index and um, overlaying the one-year rolling returns of the HFRI macro index, so the index that uh, Min has used uh, to highlight how it can be beneficial when added to a 60-40 portfolio. Um, and as you can see here, when volatility tends to tick up, macro types of strategies tend to do really well. And um, that is a unique characteristic that you tend not to find amongst either other alternative styles of investing. And it's certainly the case, not a, a um, characteristic that you tend to find from traditional assets. And so, um, again, what does that mean? If we go back to that slide at the beginning um, or you know, back on to, say, page 20, to us, that means you're going to, one, um, have a lot of return potential or a lot of alpha potential to make um, make money. And then secondly, is, is it can be a really useful diversification tool um, within an aggregate portfolio. And again, I think we've we've um, uh, highlighted you know, how that actually can um, can really benefit a, um, a total portfolio, especially in times of market stress. Um, to close things out, uh, if we just uh, maybe also then think about what are the key risks to consider within a, a macro portfolio, you know, I, I always like to um, to remind clients that this is uh, this is not easy. Uh, it's you know we're again we're talking about a very sophisticated uh, style or approach. Um, that has a lot of different ways that it can be implemented. We've talked about that from a, um, you know, all the different approaches and styles, and and then frankly, then returns that uh, can be generated and risks that are associated with these types of strategies. And so, um, again, what what you're buying um, and making an investment in when you when you identify a macro strategies, what you're essentially 
um, trading off, right, is, is um, market-led returns from active-led returns. And so um, you're trading off perceived market performance from active manager to active manager skill. And that underwriting or um, analyzing or researching, researcher researching investment skill does require, you know, really we think deep assessment of, you know, what you're ultimately getting invested in. So understanding uh, a manager, the strategies underlying concentration to uh, markets is really important. Secondly, understanding how they use leverage can be a, a really important thing to understand. Illiquidity uh, can be factored in and, and making sure that you understand that in terms of the underlying strategy is really important. Understanding how a strategy will perform uh, and be adaptable to different regime shifts is also really important. And all this comes down to, at the end of the day that the thing that I always stress is, is that simply relying on past performance um, is not, frankly, we think um, enough when making an investment in an underlying manager is you have to really do the work from the bottom up to understand what their process is before you make an investment in a macro strategy, because as I think has been highlighted, you know, that we, there can be years uh, that a macro strategy may struggle um, and understanding why that is, um, you know, ultimately how that relates back to their process and how they manage risks is really important. So th that's not to say that, um, again, we, we don't think it's a, there's a lot of really good managers out there. There are. Um, but really understanding why they do what they do um, and not necessarily relying on their past performance is really important because this is, again, an active strategy that really is all built on proven investment skill, not necessarily a perceived market opportunity. So lastly, I'll just close with a great quote from a, an also legendary um, you know, macro manager, uh, Paul Tudor Jones. Um, again, he runs... Uh, he's the CIO of a, a macro, a very well-known and established macro um, firm called Tudor Investment Corp. He was on uh, CNBC earlier uh, or late last year. And the, I love the quote, right? These are spectacular times for macro. And great times for macro are typically not good times for general investment or owning stocks and bonds. Macro works when everything is broken. And that's when you have the most volatility. And it's the best time for trading uh, the way that I do. So again, I, I think that in a lot of ways encompasses what we talked about today. Um, I hope you've uh, hope, you know, gotten some out of today's presentation. Um, and maybe with that, man, I'll turn it back over to you and see if there's any final questions. Thank you, Chris. I love that quote. That's a great quote. Um, actually, we have a ton of questions. Summarizes, but I don't think summarizes everything we've talked about. <laughs> exactly. Um, we, we do have a lot of questions, but I don't think we have enough time. So how about we just go through maybe one or two. The first one, the one that's been sure, uploaded the absolutely. most, is considering how increasingly interconnected global markets are, how do you manage potential spillover effect? Yeah, that's a really good question. Mar markets are extremely interconnected uh, today. and. Um, you know, you, you see that both in terms of the price action where, you know, one event, say in the U.S., uh, will uh, have immediate spillover effects in the European markets and then likely, um, you know, the next trading session in Asia. And so um, the way to best manage that is, frankly, to be global, right, is to, to operate a macro fund from a global perspective, we think is critical. If, again, if you look at any of the well-established outfits. Um, including our own platform, uh, we operate 24-7 um, in terms of a trade, well, 24-5 uh, trading operation and that we have um, uh, investment teams that are located around the world geographically. So as to be able to take advantage of, of this interconnectedness and ma make sure that um, you know, we, we always have our pulse on what's happening and, and can react accordingly. The other thing I think you have to do is... Um, you know, I've emphasized this at the beginning, we haven't touched a ton upon it, is this idea of, um, you know, equally emphasizing ongoing macroeconomic research alongside of trading. 
And so, um, you know, what, what we tend to find is, is that you, you really have to staff a macro portfolio with uh, equally good portfolio managers and ec uh, economists. And where we found the most success is to, to have those two different functions work together, but um, equally be independent um, and specialized. And so an example um, would be, say, again, back to you know, what's happening in the, um, in the US here with the, the debt ceiling is, is we have a macro economist that is, so fo is focused entirely right now on the US debt ceiling and how that may or may not transpire. Um, and to then communicate that information across our different portfolio teams so then they can evaluate how that is relating to the underlying markets or opportunity set that they focus on um, and invest uh, accordingly. And so, we, you know, research is so critical in these interconnected markets today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we're a little bit over the hour, so I'm so sorry, but we won't be able to have time to go through all the other questions. But um, we'll try to, if you can just maybe connect with one of our client advisor, we'll try to get the answers to you. Um, thank you so much, Chris, for you know, spending your morning with us. I pleasure. know you had to get up really early, so we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone too. It's my pleasure. In. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much.